Thank you, Claudia. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to have uh, a bit of time to talk to you about what's happened with National Farmers Union over this, uh, this past year. Uh, John and all of our friends from Nebraska, uh, thank you for the great job you're doing in hosting. Uh, we're looking forward to the tours and the uh, extra set of uh, activities that are a result of a convention that's actually a day longer than what we historically have done. So if you've been here a lot of times before, things might seem hopefully a little more relaxed uh, and uh, a, a little different than what they have been in the last few years. We did that very deliberately. Uh, it has been a very, very busy year at National Farmers Union this past year. We are at the year when USDA, in fact, is celebrating its 150th birthday, and we are playing a role in helping with that celebration. This past year saw record farm income, never before achieved in this country. $100 billion in net farm income. All the years that I was Ag Commissioner, I was just tickled if we could hit $50 billion. I paid attention to this number a lot over the years, and for a long time, it just kind of hung around that number. It's double this last year from what it has been for many, many years. And we're seeing the results of that in the rest of the economy, and some of you as farmers are seeing the results of that in the prices that you're having to pay for land and other inputs in agriculture. Uh, as Claudia indicated, uh, NFU just celebrated the 75th anniversary of All States Camp, it's sort of the hallmark of the educational effort that we have long uh, placed so much value on. And as an organization ourselves, we now celebrate uh, our 110th year uh, in this country. This last year, we started a beginning farmers institute for the first time. We made significant progress on the goals that the board of directors set almost three years ago in strategic planning uh, the first year that I served as your president. And my address this evening is going to kind of be focused around those goals. And for folks who've been listening to me over the last few years, you probably come to understand that I tend to get pretty goal focused. I think it's important as an organization that we have a plan, that we know where we're headed, and that we follow that plan. And when times change and adjustments need to be made, fine, you make the adjustments and you move on. Uh, I think that is the path to success. One of the things that you will be hearing about tomorrow is our audit report. This gets very directly to, of the eight goals that the board set in strategic planning, the first one dealt with finances in trying to get the organization on very sound financial footings. I'm pleased to report that the audit you'll be reported on here, the report of uh, tomorrow morning will be a clean audit, but it's also going to show some very important trends. Uh, and it will be important that you pay attention to those trends. We are a financially strong organization, and that financial strength comes from a strong balance sheet, which is almost solely the result of the sale of the National Farmers Union Insurance Company some years ago. That money was invested, and for much of the ensuing years, we have been living off of those investments. That's fine, you can do that for a while, but we can't do it forever. One of the things that you all got in your packets was an annual report. It's the first time we've produced an annual report for the convention in some years. And I would encourage you, when you get a chance to look at that annual report, look at the last page inside the back cover, because that page is uh, of a graph that shows the last 10 years uh, of financial summary of this organization. And one of the things that that graph shows us is that over the last 10 years, we've been spending over a million dollars a year of investment revenues. Now that's fine as long as the stock market's doing great. Most of you probably know that stock market ain't been doing that great for the last number of years. And so we've been very focused on bringing all of these numbers uh, back into line. We've had major efforts at 
cutting costs and increasing revenues. This year, for the first time in 21 years, the delegates to this convention will have the opportunity to consider a dues increase that the bylaws committee this afternoon uh, approved to forward to the membership. For all of these last 21 years, the national share of your member dues is five bucks. That's enough to buy you a nice cup of coffee at Starbucks once a year. And for that five bucks, you get what you enjoy as a member of National Farmers Union. And so it's time that we've revisited that issue, and I urge you to pay close attention to what is being proposed um, and to the need for that proposal. Our second goal really dealt with membership. And I am pleased to report this year, for the first time in a number of years, we're starting to see membership in National Farmers Union go back up. Isn't that a cool statistic? For many, many years, it's been on a downtrend. We've not turned the corner because it could well be one of those statistical aberrations, but it's nice to see membership ticking back up. We did a membership survey at the last convention in San Antonio, and many of you participated in that. And one of the things that we learned from that survey, which was mailed out across the country to a random sampling of our membership as well, is that Farmers Union members are generally quite pleased with the work that we have been doing. They're very satisfied with the organization, but they also identified a number of areas where we can improve, and one of those was in the area of membership. We just hired a new vice president of membership, uh, Lee Sladen. You will see her around here uh, at the convention. You saw her picture scrolling through the, uh, the overhead while you were enjoying dinner. Uh, and we will have a renewed focus on growing membership. We just this last year recognized a brand new uncharted state division in the state of Hawaii. How cool is that? I told these guys, yeah. And we've, got, and we've got Glenn, who's the state president in Hawaii, here. He understands that they get the charter strength. And my recommendation to the national board is we ought to think about holding the next convention in Hawaii. Now, he's got, he's got at least four years to go, okay? okay? He's got at least four years to go because we're already scheduled out in advance. But uh, he's got a goal to work for, and we're delighted that they're making real progress, and there's a lot of excitement in that state. This last year, we reorganized the Farmers Union organization in Pennsylvania. Not an easy undertaking. Not something that we do lightly. Uh, we are a grassroots organization and have long prided ourselves, and we, a national, take direction from the states. It's not the other way around. But we had a need to go in and reinvigorate the state organization in Pennsylvania, and Bob Junk, the new state president, and a whole slate of officers elected just a week ago as a result of a year and a half effort of working to reorganize is here at the convention. So a lot of good work being done in, in Pennsylvania. Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Ohio. Hastings, Carl, is, I introduced him earlier. Uh, Hastings Mutual Insurance Company is located in those six states. And we have a major effort underway to focus our state organizations in those states on growing memberships and doing it in concert with a great insurance partner, Hastings Mutual Insurance Company. We haven't seen the results of that yet. We're just starting. But we've done the planning for it. And I think all of our members in those states are excited about it. And frankly, if there's anything we ought to be focusing on, it's growing membership in heartland states where our membership is lower than it ought to be. And if there's anything we've learned over the years in Farmers Union, it is that our strongest farm organizations by far are those farm organizations that have an intricate relationship 
with our insurance partners. We need them, and they need us. In California, we stood up a new California insurance agency this last year. Just got it off the run, off the uh, drawing board, and we're starting to get organized. Uh, slower than we'd like, but nonetheless, it's an effort at growing membership uh, in a very planned, concerted way in California. We just entered into an arrangement through the Midwest Agency, uh, which is located here in Nebraska and Kansas, uh, in helping our friends in Arkansas, hopefully in an endeavor that will expand into Missouri and perhaps even over into Texas. And so a lot of excitement about all of those things. We continue to grow our membership in New England. And at the end of this convention, you will have a chance to meet our friends from New England who will be inviting us to the next annual convention which will be in the New England states. Uh, so a lot of good things about growing in some of our smaller state organizations. What makes this possible, however, is the fact that we have a strong membership base up and down the Great Plains and across the Midwest. In states like this, in states like my home state of North Dakota, where we have those strong relationships and strong financial capability, uh, and it is the strength of those states that gives us the ability to do all of these initiatives in other states. So we get that. If we're going to grow membership, we have to put resources there. And we understand that some of our states that are strong are helping to underwrite the expenses of those efforts. And that's as it should be. We are, after all, a family. Goal three deals with improving our communications efforts. Uh, we, as a part of the survey, got a number of uh, pieces of information from all of you as members last year. We started a new publication called The Washington Corner. Many of the state newsletters now are featuring news from National Farmers Union as a part of The Washington Corner. We decided to reverse an earlier decision of the board, which is based solely on saving money of stopping the paper newsletter. We reversed that decision, revamping the paper newsletter, tried to make it a little more affordable, but we're continuing to send it out to members uh, who, have, who said in the survey that that was a very important piece of communication from the national office. Um, we are becoming much more active in social media in a lot of the electronic communication with our members. If you have not given your email address to us, please do. In your members, in your packet that you got when you registered, there's a form. Give us your email address, your name and address, so we can better communicate with you. We're not going to overload your inbox. You get to choose what kind of publications, whether you want the newsletters or news releases or other kind of stuff that we send out on a very regular basis. Uh, but we need to communicate better with you so that you can better communicate with us. That's very important. Uh, and of course, a part, a major part of our strategic plan under goal three was dealing with our identity. We have had over the history of this organization many, many, many different logos. We continue to use many different logos. In fact, almost every state has their own logo. And it was very much a goal of our national board that we try to figure out a way to unite all of our various states under a common theme, a common logo, with unifying messages and appearances. And so we are proud today to unveil uh, the new logo. You've been seeing it around the convention. There you see it on the screen. That's the logo. Every state, of course, we would encourage to adopt this logo. Uh, we know that you're not all going to do it, certainly not all immediately. But we encourage you, as you begin to sort through how you present your face to the general public and how you reach out to new members, that you think about becoming part of the larger family and uniting behind this new logo. Uh, it, we spent a lot of time and effort in pulling this together. 
Uh, Harley Danielson is one of the strategic planners that we used all through this process, and he uh, helped us engage with a professional firm to help develop this. We've been working on it for more than the last year. We've used focus groups, an identity committee, a board members, et cetera. Historically, the triangle has been at the heart of what Farmers Union is and has been, and it remains at the heart. All of you know that education is at the base of that triangle, legislation and cooperation on the sides, that is what unifies us as a farm organization. So that triangle, a nod to that triangle, the symbolism behind it is represented by the three stars re, uh, organized in the shape of a triangle on the new logo. Uh, the blue represents the sky. The wave is already used as the part of the logo in a number of states, and these are just several examples, sort of this waviness to the new logo. Uh, the new logo uses that wave to represent both field and water because we've got a lot of new members now that make their living from the water. It also represents a progressive type of forward thinking, which is pretty much in our DNA. Gold was chosen as a neutral color, but also represents prosperity and wisdom. So a lot of thought went into putting this together, and it's underlain by the tagline called United to Grow Family Agriculture. United, very symbolic, united in purpose, acting as one, together as a family. Grow, of course, implies improving, expanding, strengthening. What we do in agriculture is grow things. Family agriculture, if there's anything that has been consistent throughout the history of Farmers Union, it has been that we are here to represent family farmers, family ranchers, family fishermen, family businesses, families, families. And so family agriculture represents all of that. Uh, a lot of thought to that. And we're, we're really excited about this. There's a major effort to, you'll see it all over this convention and hopefully you'll begin seeing it uh, in more and more of your state level communications uh, as well. This was important because as we begin to retool our communications efforts and get into sort of this new century that we're already well over a decade into, uh, we need to have a common theme and a common look. Our fourth goal, and the last one I'm really gonna talk about this evening, is the one dealing with the Farm Bill. Uh, when we went through the strategic planning, there was a lot of focus on, we have to get our story right for this next Farm Bill. This is not going to be an easy farm bill. You heard Colin Peterson talk about it earlier this evening. You know that we face a Congress that in many ways is as dysfunctional as any we have ever had. And it used to be that folks said that as a laugh line. Today, it is a sobering representation of what happens with our government, a dysfunctional Congress. None of us need or want or take pride in having a dysfunctional Congress, but yet we all know that that's the position we face. Historic low approval ratings. Unable to deal with the huge issues of our time. Debts and deficits that need to be dealt with. They don't need to be dealt with today and solved today, but by gosh, we all know there needs to be a plan to get them under control. And yet, our Congress seems unable to even get that done. On top of that, you have an election year when it's just more difficult to get anything done. The best news of all of this is part of the news that Colin just delivered to us. We've known it for a long time. If there is any example of bipartisanship anywhere in Congress, it, it's found in the agriculture committees. The action that they did as a part of the super committee effort exemplifies that. The only committees in all of Congress that actually did what they were legally required to do, and yet the super committee failed because the rest of them didn't do it. Uh, and so if there's any hope here, it is that we have committees that historically have operated in a bipartisan fashion. Uh, 
It's important for us to understand a couple things about this farm bill. Besides the big debts and the deficits that I already talked about, understand with me that the farm bill represents about 2% of total federal spending. Also understand that of every dollar of federal spending, the government today is borrowing between 40 and 43 cents, okay? So for those who come out thumping their fist on the podium and saying, by God, if we just solve these big, nasty subsidies all you rich, lazy farmers are getting, we can solve the deficit problem. That's 2% of the budget. They're borrowing 43 cents of every dollar they spend. That, if they wiped it out, it wouldn't make a, debt, a dent hardly in the deficit. In addition to that, in the farm bill, in that 2%, where is most of the money spent? Most of the money, frankly, is spent in a place that we think makes a lot of sense. It's spent in the nutrition title. Two-thirds to three-fourths of the spending goes for programs to help folks who don't have enough food to put in their belly and they go to bed hungry at night. School lunch programs, school breakfast programs, food stamps, SNAP programs, folks to feed hungry people. If there's anything that we in agriculture ought to agree about, and I know that we in Farmers Union do agree about, it is that we farm to produce food so that people don't go hungry. And so that's where the bulk of the spending is spent in the Farm Bill. What remains in terms of the major parts of spending in the Farm Bill are really two major places. The conservation title, which we all support. We know that if we're going to keep farming, we better be able to make sure that we're going to take care of the land and the water and the air for the future. Or we won't be around for another 110 years. And after that, the third major area is in what I would call safety net programs. Things like crop insurance and other sort of uh, programs to help farmers through difficult times. Those safety net programs in total represent about one-fourth of one penny of a one dollar of federal spending. One-fourth of one percent of total federal spending is in those safety net. Those are the ones that most of the folks that are pounding the fists and saying, we need to get rid of this because it'll help solve the budget. Uh, th those are the ones that they're talking about. And so we face some big challenges. There's no question about it in this next farm bill. Uh, but we're going to rise to this challenge. We are, as a part of this effort, uh, in the past year, based on direction from the last uh, annual convention and direction from your national board, we entered into a major study through our foundation with Dr. Daryl Ray, and Daryl is here in the audience and will be presenting tomorrow during the convention, looking at a new, more affordable safety net. After all, what we want in a safety net is something very simple. It's something that's gonna help when times are difficult. Principally, two ways. When the market collapses and when disaster strikes. And we can point to all kinds of examples of disaster striking. You just have to turn on the news and you can see what's happening around the country with tornadoes and other weather events. But during the growing season when disasters strike, whether it's droughts or floods or you name it, we need crop insurance to be strong so it can help folks not to make a profit those years, but to help to sort of get enough money together so they can live to farm another day. It doesn't have to be elaborate, but it has to be a real safety net. And when the market collapses, as it surely will again, as sure as it is high today, it will go down in the future. When that happens, we need something in place to help take the sting out of it so we don't have the continued loss of family farming and family agriculture that we have seen so much of in recent years. In the last, uh, and so that, that program that Daryl is talking about is we're referring it to, uh, to it as MIDAs, a market-driven inventory system. Interestingly, we released phase one of this report right uh, in conjunction with the fly-in last September. And what is so phenomenal about phase one of this report it looked back. Phase one, we really looked at 
What was government spending from 1998 to 2010? 13 years, okay? What did we spend for government spending on farm subsidies, safety net programs, if you will? And then Daryl ran a simulation of what would happen if you put a market-driven inventory system in place that provided some sort of a floor price, provided a mechanism to pull uh, surplus production in times of very low prices, hold it off the market solely within farmer uh, ownership, and then release it back when prices got better. What would happen? And interestingly, in that scenario, in that simulation, what he discovered is that we would have saved as taxpayers 60% of all the money that we sent out to farmers. Folks that want to brag about farm programs that allow the market to work and farmers to get their income from the marketplace, they ought to take a look at this program because it results in far fewer federal government transfer dollars to farmers and allows the market to play the role that it really ought to. It would have saved 60% of all government spending while at the same time it would have held net farm income at stable levels throughout the whole study period. It would have increased prices on average for the major commodities through the entire study period, but more importantly, it would have increased them in the very low price periods. Uh, when I was having dinner with Howard Buffett, and he'll be talking to us shortly, one of the things we're talking about is $2 corn. It wasn't that long ago we had $2 corn. You go back to the late 90s and early 2000s, and much of that early period of this study port was the market bouncing around $2 corn. Uh, that will happen again. And so most importantly, what this phase one of the study showed was that in that price period, it would have significantly increased farm prices uh, and would have increased net farm income, and in fact, would even have increased net a value of exports across the entire study period. Not because we're selling more, because when the market is low and we hold the price a bit higher, we're gonna sell a little less. But because of the way the market fundamentals work, we actually sell that little bit less at quite a bit more money, and so total value of exports significantly increased. You'll be hearing more about that during uh, the convention here. Uh, and the benefits of this program would then have accrued to us as farmers. Uh, they would have accrued to the ethanol industry. They would have accrued to the livestock industry because you'd have significantly less price volatility, increased prices in the low price pieces, uh, price periods, but take that big, heavy peak that's driven land prices through the roof, we would have squashed that down a little bit. We still had the upward price movement, but not to the extent that it happened. And probably most importantly, it would have benefited consumers. And it would have been an aid to hungry people, not only in this country, but around the world. So that's a big part of the task that we have in front of us and a big part of what we focus on in this next Farm Bill, but it's not the only part. We also are working on a livestock title. If there's anything that's true about the history of Farmers Union, it is that we believe in competition in markets. We don't want markets to operate without competition because they don't operate efficiently, and most of the time, we on the receiving end of these markets end up getting the short end of the stick. And so we have done a lot of work in this past year on the GYPSA rule as a great example in trying to get more competition restored to the marketplace. We're disappointed, ultimately, not just in what USDA finally proposed in a, fi in a final rule because it was quite a bit watered down from what was initially proposed, but even more, we were bitterly disappointed that it was Congress that stopped USDA from doing the next series of rules to begin to restore competition and fairness to the livestock markets. You know, it sort of reminds me of cool all over again. You folks who've been following this, and we were strong supporters of country of origin labeling. Why? Because 80 plus percent of consumers want to know where their food comes from. That's why. If we ought to do anything in business, it's pay attention to what our customers want. That's pretty much fundamental stuff. And if consumers want to know where their food comes from, we ought to be able to tell them. 
And so we advocated strongly for country of origin labeling laws in the 2002 Farm Bill, got it in the bill. And then what happened? The next year, Congress, through the appropriations process, put a rider on the appropriations that said USDA can't implement it. And the year after, they did the same thing. And the year after, the same thing. And the year after, the same thing. Until in the last Farm Bill, we brought our forces together again with the help of our champions in Congress. We passed another version of country of origin labeling, and it, in fact, was implemented. Now we've got a whole other series of challenges we're facing around that, but nonetheless, that's the process. The process moves slowly. And so the GYPSA rule is, in a lot of ways, very similar. We finally got it incorporated as a part of a, the requirement of the 2008 Farm Bill. It was beginning to be implemented by USDA, and then a reactionary Congress uh, and a well-placed appropriations committee member or member said, we're going to stop them from doing this because we're getting our campaign cash from other folks who have different priorities. And fairness in the marketplace for family farmers and ranchers isn't very high on that priority list. And so it got pushed back. It got stopped. We'll live to fight that this year and next year and likely the year after. And eventually, we're going to get to where we're going to have more fair treatment in the marketplace. So a lot of work with GYPSA, with COOL, a lot of work on focusing more on customers, and a lot of work on this next farm bill, uh, figuring out just how we play a constructive role in a Congress that's very divided, that's very dysfunctional, that is certainly going to write a bill with a lot less money. We've got our work cut out for us. But you, as the delegates at this convention, I have full confidence will give us the right kind of direction, the right kind of policy direction, so that we will know exactly what we ought to be arguing for when we get back to Congress and start talking, re-engaging on this next Farm Bill. The balance of the goals in our strategic plan, I'm not going to talk about. They were dealing with things like education and cooperatives and grants and staffing needs and all those kinds of things. But I'm not going to give you that whole thing tonight because it's important, just like a strategic plan is about setting priorities and following them, we need to, to focus on the top priorities and the top four goals I just talked about are the ones that the board said these are the most important things to focus on first. And so we're doing that. We'll talk about the other things later. Many of these goals, as you can readily see, are intertwined. But I'm here to tell you that we have made a lot of progress. I, I believe that the state of the Farmers Union is strong today, and it is getting stronger. And I believe that over the next few days, you will see ample evidence to justify just exactly why I believe that way. Once again, welcome to the annual convention uh, that is celebrating 110 years of Farmers Union history. And with that, thank you, Claudia, the podium is yours. <laughs>